thanks for joining us for this new Lunch and Learn panel series where we're going to talk about offshoring. We're here thanks to Profit Master Global Outsourcing Premium Offshoring Solutions. For those of you that don't know my name, I'm Paul Jantz. And again, thanks for joining us all today. Now, we're going to be here for about 45, 50 minutes as we learn a lot more about offshoring number one, and we also learn about how to build a global workforce. I think that's just as important. To everyone online, you guys have a chat bar there, which you'll be able to use for any questions you may have. Plus we'll have, and sorry, we'll give everyone the opportunity at the end of this to unmute yourself and to ask questions both to Richard and Derek as well. Probably a good opportunity for me to get into that and introduce you to both of these gentlemen. Our Lunch and Learn series, panel series, you know, this is the first of three we're gonna be doing. So we'll begin, there's, there's a whole heap we're gonna be launching over the next few months. So please be with us, stay with us as we continue to work through everything that we've got. So we've got the founder and CEO of Outsource Accelerator, Derek, Derek Gallimore, how are you Derek? Doing great, thanks. Yeah, Fantastic. yeah excited Thank to be joining. here. And I've also got the founder and CEO of Profit Master Global Outsourcing. I've got Richard Croker. How are you, Rich? Hey, Paul. Hey, Derek. Hi. Hi, Richard. How are you? And Derek, thanks for joining us. I, I know you're coming to us from Dubai, so at different times. I'm not even sure what the time is over there, but I think it's early. Yeah, slightly. It's 6 a.m. over here, so it's an early lunch. <laughs> it's an early lunch. Very, very true. Now, as we get started, is it okay for you guys to both share a little bit about yourselves? Maybe a quick 60 seconds. I'll kick off with you, Derek. Are you okay with that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so quick intro. Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, I am the CEO and founder of Outsource Accelerator. We are the trip advisor for the outsourcing industry. So we have a website covering about 3,000 outsourcing firms globally, uh, and we generally are massive proponents of global employment, uh, which is the whole concept of offshore staffing in every form. Uh, the entire outsourcing industry is worth about 250 billion globally. It's a highly, highly sophisticated, um, very evolved, now very mature market. It's been going about 30 years. So we represent that market um, and cater mainly to SMEs, but also to enterprise as well. Brilliant. Thank you. I like the um, the example of TripAdvisor because then people sort of get that. I heard the I heard one the other day that sort of mentioned we are the the booking.com, you know, and I think it's 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 clever. It's so people tend to get that straight away, mm. which is brilliant. Rich, what about yourself? Thanks, Paul. And uh Derek, great to have you with us and uh welcome everybody also. Um so as Paul uh, mentioned, I started uh I am the founder and I'm also the CEO of Profit Master. Uh we started back in 2014, so it's our 10th anniversary this year. Um, I also met Derek uh, some 10 years ago, and uh, I'm very happy to say that we are users of the uh, Outsource, Outsource Accelerator platform. Um, for my part, um, I'm a chartered accountant by trade. Um, I came to the Philippines looking for a way to um, reduce cost. Um, I immediately learned that the outsourcing um, model for Australian professional services firms is much more than just saving cost. And uh, we've built our business around that. We're currently about 100 staff. Um, we're probably um, uh, 50, um, actually probably 70% specifically in uh, professional services of accounting, um, including auditing and insolvency, as well as taxation and business services. And then also we work with uh, mortgage brokers, finance brokers, financial planners. And then alongside that, we have a, um, a developing engineering division. Um, we're based in Clark, uh, the Clark Freeport zone, which is about 100 kilometres north of um, Manila. I'm very happy to say that when I first started going over there, that could be up to a five hour trip with the opening of the new Skyway there. It's about a two hour, two to two and a half hour trip. But um, I enjoy going over there. Um, uh, my wife and I are travelling over there shortly and um, looking forward to this chat, Paul. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Rich. And there's more people coming in. So thanks again for joining us if you've just joined us. Um, this is probably an interesting one because talking to the amount of firms that I work with uh, in the professional services industry, you know, 
people are considering a global workforce, but I suppose they don't know how to identify the need. So how do I do that? If I'm looking, if I'm an employer, I am looking at other areas. I think Richard, you just mentioned, it's not all about cost savings, but we're going to talk about that today as well. How do I start? Where do I start in terms of identifying the need for this global workforce? Who would like to kick me off? Uh, I, I can start, I suppose. Um, okay. So look, uh, it, it used to be a fringe kind of activity to go offshore and used to be really kind of leading edge um, to, to really ever attempt it. And this whole concept has really only been around for 30 years and it's enabled by telecommunications. But before telecommunications, there just simply was no opportunity. And of course, then came along high-speed internet and stuff like that. So it not only increased availability, but it increased bandwidth and capacity of what people can do. Now, you know, obviously following COVID and things like that, it, it, people are more normalized and accepting of remote work. Now, I'm not necessarily a massive remote work, um, you know, um, protagonist. I believe that people are better in offices, but it opens up the world to global employment. And simply put, it is far better to hire from a global pool of talent, which is, you know, potentially sort of seven, eight billion people big, as opposed to hiring from your local vicinity, just because you are localized to that vicinity. So when you sort of start looking at the global employment opportunity, uh, you can typically save salaries, uh, save total employment costs of kind of 60 to 70%. Um, but you just have abundant uh, talent pool out there. Uh, and it's not just administrators. It's not just call center staff. It is anything you need from, you know, executives to developers, to designers, to content writers, to, um, you know, accounting, finance, any professional role, any role that's done in front of a computer can be done offshore and highly efficiently and effectively. So it's really just looking at it now, it's no longer really this fringe alternative. Um, it can be every role within your business almost, uh, and it's very easy, very accessible, and it's so profound that you really can't ignore it now. Well said, well said. Rich, you got anything to add? Look, I agree with that. Um, it, it's, it's actually um, one of the things that we're seeing in our business particularly in engineering, for example, where we have a, in, in, a, in a particular group, we have a growing area of cost estimators. Now, it was only a couple of years ago where people, particularly in Australia, were actually finding it hard to understand the concept of taking um, a, a cost estimator and having them sitting somewhere overseas. Um, one of the things, as Derek has pointed out, is the telecommunications capability that we have now has really allowed us to do that. And it's interesting to, to note that, you know, over that 30 years that this has been developing, um, there've been a number of companies that have gone before, before us. Um, but one of the things that has happened now is that uh, where they were call centers and, and you know, fairly uh, basic um, tasks that were being done uh, over a long period, over, over those early years, this has now developed into something that is highly technical, highly advanced. Um, and, just to take the point of the question, which is how do you establish the need, um, whether you need to have outsourcing. outsourcing. Um, and, and somewhere along here, we should talk about the difference between outsourcing and offshoring, because they do two different things and people often um, confuse them. But um, uh, interestingly, in the 2023-24 Hayes uh, a Salary Guide, uh, which is a guide used particularly in the finance sector for valuing the salaries of accountants and uh, auditors and bookkeepers and tax professionals, um, mortgage brokers and stuff like that. Um, in, the, in the preference to that, the CEO identified um, that the talent shortage that is occurring in Australia uh, post COVID is unlikely to, reveal, to, release, to relieve itself for some time to come. And that is partly borne out by the number of graduates who are coming through the accounting schools. And I've often argued that um, uh, the accounting graduates are now coming through, um, sometimes through the technical um, skills area, a certificate three, certificate four in, in bookkeeping and accounting. Um, and 
the, it means that uh, the number of actual graduates in the accounting profession is going down. Going down. So we need to look at where is that where is that talent going to come from? Mm. And then you take a country like the Philippines, where um, many years ago they made the distinction between an accounting degree and accounting science degrees or accounting technology degree. So um, uh, that talent pool of accounting technologists has just grown and grown and grown. And that's only an example of Philippines and, and accounting. So what you've got on the one hand in Australia is a, a continuing shortage of talent for this profession, but a continuing growth of that talent in, in a country like the Philippines. There, there's the matchup right there, if you understand what I mean. Yeah. And it's, it's not only in accounting, but you know, you go down to the, where was I somewhere? As, as you know, I'm touring at the moment, Paul, but I was somewhere and um, I wanted to go and get some gas for my caravan. And they said, well, you're gonna have to wait overnight for the gas. And I said to the guy, why? He said, I haven't got enough staff to fill up the, the gas bottles during the day, I'll do it overnight. So this talent shortage, the skills shortage, the people shortage is not just limited to the professional services, but it's quite widespread. And uh, people like me are able to, uh, to uh, fulfill that gap where we can provide a much wider talent pool for people who need it. Now you mentioned offshoring outsourcing. Do you want to talk about that quickly? Sure. Um, look, the, in the early days, and, and I, I was um, a, a victim of this in the very, very early days. Um, and I'm taught, when I say early days, for me, early days is 10 years ago, as, as Derek pointed out, it's been going much longer. But there are terms that they use in the outsourcing sector that um, are really quite interesting and, and, and some are a bit of a misnomer. And I'll, I'll pick the difference between outsourcing and offshoring. And I'll also use another term of um, seat leasing and staff leasing. And, you know, they're really not that complicated to understand when you think about it. But offshore uh, outsourcing is the, the outsourcing of a project. So, for example, you might go to your accountant or a person, a business person might go to their accountant to ask them to fulfill their financial statements, do their tax returns and lodge them. That's the the project outsourcing of the preparation of financial services and tax return. Now that's different to offshoring. Offshoring is where you take a, 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 a conglomerate of tasks and have done in an offshore location as opposed to being done in the local location. Yep. Now, then if I could just come to the terms of, of seat leasing and um, um, uh, seat leasing and staff leasing, it, there's, they're really not that complicated. Seat leasing is simply a, a, a place where somebody like me provides a seat for somebody to put us, for a client to put a staff member in that seat, or I might even recruit the staff member to put in the seat. That's, that's seat leasing. Staff leasing is nothing more than a secondment of staff. So in my case, Profit Master would make a staff member available to a client and they work exclusively for that client. It's more, it's, it's a secondment. So, um, I just want to distinguish the, uh, the the different terminology that we use. It's not complex. Just yep. a, a good place to start is to understand it. No, I'd agree with that. And I think you know, at, at the moment, let's say for example, I I outsource all of my marketing to somebody that I work with for all my design work and everything like that. But I am looking to put on an offshoring person that can work for me full time in a marketing capacity. So it is very different. So, I, yep. That's a that's a very very good distinction. So that's helps my brain. That's for sure in how I can work that. And that's probably something that I've, to be honest, I've sort of worked through as well. Like, yeah, you've got different, especially from a marketing point of view, we do a lot of that. But how do you get a team member that's a part of that to use Derek's term? Sorry, I'm letting somebody else in to use Derek's term. Um, become a global workforce because when you then get to that global workforce, how much more accessibility do you have to skills? So I, I, I completely agree with that. So how do we start to identify, Derek, it's probably a good one. I'll throw to you for this one. What's the process to identifying an offshore partner? Yeah, look, um, it, there's a lot of criteria really, but they're pretty interchangeable. And a lot of outsourcing firms, there are a lot of outsourcing firms here uh, in the world now. There's about 3,000 on our website and we actually have about 50 to 100 uh, register for our directory every month. So there's there's a lot. What you have to be careful of, just like any business, is that they are established, they know what they're doing <laughs> fundamentally, okay? And 
you know, that's hard. That's relatively hard to differentiate because they're all going to give you a good sales spiel. Um, and so it's really checking out the scale of the company. How big are they? How many seats do they have? How many staff do they have? Uh, and then really looking at the executive leadership, who is the leadership there? And then the sort of senior to top level management that's actually going to look after the functions. The, the major determinants of success of an offshore uh, engagement is 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 quite unusual though in that it, the large majority of success is actually attributable to the staff that you are allocated okay whether they are recruited specifically for your needs or they're kind of allocated to you and so if you end up with a really good staff member working on your team then actually everything can be dreamy you know there's there's no problems and you could work in you could be working with the worst outsourcing firm in the world but you don't need a lot of extra assistance versus you could actually have the best outsourcing firm in the world um, and very bad staff. And of course, your experience is going to be terrible. The production and quality and, you know, everything is also going to be terrible. So a lot of it hinges on the staff that are recruited for you. And typically as well, then that is, you know, involves the recruitment process. So it's important to find out about that equally as well regardless of the sort of organization, the person that you probably have most contact with from that organization is your account manager or the client services manager. Now, if you go with a big firm, that could be one of the best firms in the world, but you get a sort of substandard account manager or typically with the bigger firms, you get younger, more green account managers, you know, and they don't really understand business, they don't really understand HR fundamentals and employment and things like that, then also you're not going to have a great experience if you need those resources. So there's a few sort of points of um, consideration when uh, you are considering outsourcing firms. But generally, generally, what I would say is in regards to the market, it is very mature, it's very established now, and there are far more basically the majority of people are good players good actors and you don't need to be too worried about you know sort of unscrupulous happenings with offshoring these things yeah brilliant brilliant rich anything you'd like to add there yeah look i, I agree with derek that the staff member you have um it, 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 the staff member whether they're provided or allocated to you recruited or whatever the staff member is going to make the biggest um uh, impact on the relationship that you have um, between the client and the and the staff or the outsourcing company. Um, <clears throat> a couple of things I'd add to it is that um, recruitment and HR are probably the next most important thing to check out. Um, make sure that you are working with a uh, a good quality firm that provides good quality HR and recruitment. Um, and again, your your account managers. So we call them team leaders in our in our group. Um, uh, our team leaders are mature age; they're not younger. Um, uh, and I agree that if you uh, the bigger companies uh, tend to be working with younger team leaders, we've taken a different option that we wanted our team leaders to be mature operators um, to be able to work with our younger team. Uh, keeping in mind that 100% of our staff are graduates, um, they come to us. Um, with certain expectations about their career development and everything like that. So it's a challenge to, from an HR and an operations perspective to make sure that they're being uh, catered for in relation to their career development. But just go back though, um, uh, there's a couple of things that when you're actually looking for an outsourcing partner that you really, really, really need, and they're, they're just the same fundamentals of working with an important supplier that you have in your home country, in our case, Australia. So you're not walking into a six month relationship. You're not walking into a one year relationship. If you're serious about this and want to build a, a true global team, you're talking about a two, three, four, five year relationship. Mm -hmm. And you want to be able to map that out from the get go. So if somebody's just saying to you, well, I, I can give you a staff member and it's going to cost you X number of dollars or pesos or whatever it is. Um, that may be not what you're looking for. If you're looking to build a global team, you should be looking beyond the first staff member, the second, the fifth, the 10th, the 15th and beyond. Um, so that then comes down to the, um, the longevity and the experience of the organization itself. 
And then also you want to be able to have a loyal relationship with that with that provider. So uh, it's, it's a, a very open relationship that you have to have. If you've got a problem, you need to know that you can go to somebody in that organization and get the problem dealt with. And you also need to know that if there is a problem that somebody in the organization is going to report it back to you so that you, you're capable of managing that issue together. And that comes down to loyalty of the relationship between the company and the provider and also the integrity of the business as well. If you've got a business and, and um, Derek made this point that the majority of operators are, are work with integrity these days, um, Derek and I could both tell you stories where that was not the case. Um, that in integrity of people wanting to spin a good sales field from the start did not necessarily mean a good provider. Um, so the integrity of the provider is very, provider is very important. Um, and that's nothing to say about the, the capability of the staff. If you're recruiting good staff and you give them good conditions in a good office with good pay, um, that's the, 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 uh, the, the capability that you need to be able to get and where they're sourcing them from. So if I just use an example, our, our more senior staff are recorded, re, re, uh, recruited to be Australian experienced accountants. But then we have junior staff who are coming in straight from university or, or maybe one year's at local experience before they get transferred over into an Australian environment. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the HR and the recruitment people need to be able to provide the skill set that is required by the client. And therefore, the client needs to be able to explain the skill set that's required as well. Um, Oh, it's just one other thing that I, if I could mention it there. Um, and, and this is something that we haven't touched on yet, which is security, information security, particularly in the professional firms and where you've got issues with privacy, um, uh, data management, uh, business continuity, um, uh, essential eight that's coming in into Australia. You want yep. to know that you're working with, the, uh, with, with a company that is across that sort of stuff. And it was interesting what Derek said about he prefers to see people working in the office. We're the same. Uh, we, we, almost without exception, we require our staff to be working in the office at least for a period of time before they can even be considered to go hybrid, let alone work from home. Um, so security is just a very important, um, physical security and IT security is a very important issue that you need to work out in choosing a provider. It's a good point. So let, let's talk about that. You mentioned you know, the savings or it's not always about the savings and you're right, things like security. We only saw what happened last week with CrowdStrike and the effect on the global market, I suppose. Let's talk about the sorts of things that companies are looking for apart from savings and those savings that are there, because I know sort of Derek mentioned a little bit about that before as well. The savings are quite significant. What are they as well? Who would like to kick that off? I'll, I'll have a shot at that. Um, so what, what, what are my clients looking for? Um, one of the most important things they're looking for, obviously, is the skill set. Um, the next thing that they're looking for is the potential long, longevity of the staff member. How long is the tenure of that staff member going to be? Yep. Even in Australia, we have an issue with people swapping jobs because salaries are changing so quickly. Um, you know, the, the, the Gen Z generation is, uh, is, is impacting um, how people want to work and everything like that. So the tenure is a very important thing. Um, one of the other things that we find is the uh, the reputability of the uh, of the organisation in providing proper uh, resources and proper um, facilities for the staff member. So um, believe it or not, um, I still get people who say, um, I, 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 "Have you guys got a proper office and stuff like that?" Um, if you walked into my office, you know, well, Paul, you've been there. It's a uh, it's a five-star facility. People have an office and a desk and all the facilities just like you would have in an A-class office in Australia. Um, and then the next thing, of course, is uh, information security. Um, uh, how do you measure um, uh, what information security you've got and uh, uh, how do you test it and how do you report it? Um, what happens if the whole thing fails? Uh, business continuity and stuff like that. They're, they're the things that my clients are looking for. And also contact and communication uh, between the, uh, uh, the operations management and, uh, and the client operations management. They want to know that there's communication going on. Yep, yep. Derek, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, look, in terms of costs, uh, it's, it's really critical that people don't focus too much on the, um, 
you know, getting the maximum saving they can from going offshore. Uh, you know, I typically throw around the number that you can save about 70% on your all in costs. Okay. Now, significantly, that is your all in costs. Okay. With any employment in Australia, New Zealand, the US, and the Philippines, there's a lot of on top costs with yes. any employee. And they are really, really significant. You know, anything from sort of hardware to uh, office space to all of the pensions and health insurance and those sort of things. So when you really add in all of the costs of employment, then you can typically save about 70%. But don't let that be a focus. Too much people are sort of chasing the pennies and forgetting the dollars. And um, it is far better to get really high quality, highly capable staff offshore, as opposed to, you know, you can maybe scrape around and find someone for sort of $1 an hour, $2 an hour, $3 an hour. They will typically, you know, being sort of generalist here, um, they will typically be a complete waste of time. You'll be banging your head against the wall and it will be, a, you know, extremely frustrating. So it's about finding high quality staff. You also, you know, what people seem to forget is, you know, you can easily source a VA, an admin assistant, an intern for very, very little but actually the nominal amount that you're saving when you when you are hiring the sort of entry level staff is in the hundreds of dollars every month whereas you can look to hire senior executives senior developers senior you know whatever um accountants cfos um medical staff all of those you will be saving you know potentially thousands if not tens of thousands per month and so that is where you actually really get the significant uplift from coming offshore and there are people forget people sort of associate the philippines with call centers and vas and things like that there are mbas in the philippines there are harvard graduates in the philippines there is google here facebook here amazon procter and gamble all of the big four accounting firms you know there are very highly skilled highly capable executive talent in the philippines uh, and that is where the true value lies if you're able to get good, capable senior staff working on your team. Yeah, well said, well said. So I'll just touch that, on that a little bit more of that, uh, Paul. Yeah, go for it, go for it. Um, that's, you're exactly right. That, those, like, we have auditors, and, you know, an auditor is easily seventy to $100,000 in Australia, whereas when you take an auditor in the Philippines, it's a hell of a lot cheaper. Um, to be able to do that. And that cost saving goes on to uh, onto the client. The point that Derek makes about the, the, the basic labor cost, you might see something for a couple of dollars an hour, but there are some things like PhilHealth, uh, Puggy Big, um, uh, SSS, SSS, you know, they're things like compared to HMO. Australia, 13th month. month, which is a funny thing. Um, mm -hmm. But those sort of things add to that cost. And then you've also got the the, the add-ins that the company provides as well. Um, and I, I reckon that 70% on labor cost is around about right. But then you've still got an office cost, you've still got computer costs, you've still got security costs, you've still got software costs, um, you know, things like that. So when we look at it, we look at the, the labor cost, we look at the management cost, and then we look at the office cost. And even then, by the time all of that, is added up. If you just take a, an auditor, a tax specialist, a, um, uh, a an insolvency specialist, um, a a good quality financial planner, for example, Derek's right. Even with all of that added on, they're tens of thousands of dollars that you're saving, and that goes straight to your bottom line per staff member. Very good point. So, in terms of this this global team that's out there, and I suppose I'm coming to let's say we've established this. Now let's come to, let's say, the management of this and scaling the global team. What's your thoughts on how to manage this the best or the best practice to managing team members that are located all around the world, let's say? Well, you go, Derek. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll start. So look, just start small, start uh, simple and have clearly defined roles. Typically, you know, with the concept of outsourcing, people often try and outsource their problems, okay? So, you know, if, if you're growing a business and you can't get the sales function to work, 
you you phone up an outsourcer and say, look, I want you to build my sales function. And that's really, really, really hard to do because you're adding complexity. This is something that you haven't necessarily conquered yourself yet. Yeah. You're adding that complexity onto the complexity of running an offshore team. What you want to do, you want to set this up for success. You want to um, have processes within your business that you have already mastered. The processes are very simplistic. They're very um, reliable. They're very repeatable. Start with that. Okay, take the easy roles and offshore those because what you're doing is you're stacking the, the slight complexity and something that you now need to master, which is offshore staffing onto a simple task. Yes. Get that done offshore and then you can start layering in complexity. You can move across to different functions. You can move into sales, but you need a beachhead of simple, repeatable tasks that can be done in the Philippines. That allows you to learn the whole concept of offshoring yourself, learn remote work, learn how to communicate with people from the Philippines and build an effective sort of team over there. Um, it might also help you as a business become more mature in terms of your, your processes, your process mapping, your KPIs, your reporting, all of that stuff that is really valuable when you have offshore teams. Um, then you can go infinitely more complex. So there's no limit to what you can offshore. Basically, any role that is done in front of a computer can be done offshore. So there's no limit to it. But what I just do, what I say is I just caution people, don't take your hardest task that you've never really been able to do yourself and get some poor, poor sort of schlep offshore to try and do that, okay? Because that will, that will fail. That will fail. Fail. And so set it up for success, do things simply, and then scale from there. Great advice. Great advice. Rich, anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, he, Derek's so right. Um, I'll, I'll give you the example in, in Australia. Um, th this is the example of people uh, wanting to offshore their problem or, or outsource their problem. Um, I, I've had cases, and I still have them on the books, um, where um, an accounting firm will come to me and say, I'd like to get somebody who uh, has five years of Australian experience, is completely conversant with the Australian Tax Act and can do tax planning and uh, tax research, for example, right? And I say, well, look, I can also provide unicorns. Um, it's, it's just really, uh, you've really got to walk into this with a, um, with a careful plan, uh, start small, uh, get your processes right. Um, uh, start simply, uh, whether you start with it in the professional services firm, and, and I, that's my niche, so I'm speaking in that sense, but um, uh, start small, whether it's going to be a bookkeeper or a VA or something like that, or even a, a, a mid-level intermediate accountant or something like that. Start small and then work wider from and wider and up from there. Uh, process mapping, if you're going to have seven, eight, nine, ten people in your team or more, the, the process mapping is, is essential. You need somebody who is able to control um, exactly what's being done there and being able to report back on whether or not it's being achieved. And that also brings up the idea of um, a, a champion in Australia. If you're a partner in a firm, um, it, it's probably difficult for you to monitor everything that's happening with the, uh, with the, the outsourced staff member. Having a champion within the, within the local firm that takes this on and has the desire to make, make it successful is also a very good way to be. Um, that person can help with the mapping. I mean, as you know, Paul, we've got people in our organization who can do process mapping um, uh, for, for a small group through to a large group. Um, but having that champion within the Australian firm is an important aspect uh, to success. Good point, good point. So how do you, how, so what's the, what's the advice piece on Finding that person, working out. We've just heard you guys talk about the the call it the lower end. Don't give them the hard work because it just won't work. You're setting them up for failure, and you want to set them up to succeed. Then, how do you go on managing the quality ongoing and the performance of that work moving forward? Who would like to touch on that? I, I would like to take that up. Um, can I just touch on um, uh, the success from the start? Um, a couple of things that are worth thinking about is the, the way in which somebody works. Um, they could be working from home as a direct hire. 
they could be a hybrid worker or they could be an office worker. Um, if you're inexperienced in the in in offshoring, um, I would not recommend a direct hire from the start. Um, somebody who's working from home, I would not recommend that from the start. There are all sorts of compl complications in working cross jurisdictional. Um, they're not only uh, in getting the person to work, but there are security issues, there are legal issues, um, there are ju uh, jurisdictional issues in both of those places. It's, it's a hard one to do. And what a lot of people have done post COVID is they've gone onto Upwork and places like that, um, or, or use LinkedIn as well to secure, a, um, to secure a staff member to work direct. If you're not experiencing what you're doing uh, in terms of outsourcing and offshoring, you're setting yourself up for a fail. And if I look back over the years, the number of people that I've spoken to who say that outsourcing has failed, when you talk to them about how they did it, did it now you start to understand why there were yeah. mistakes all the way yeah. along in, in the process. If you do it right, you'll get it right. Yeah. Um, now, as for the performance management, um, I, I can talk for our organisation and maybe Derek could speak, speak more generally, um, but we have regular performance management from the get go. Um, our operations uh, leaders are continually in, in touch with the staff member to check that they are meeting the standards of the, pro uh, uh, the processes that they're working on, uh, to confirm that they are working to the, the uh, requirements of the client. They're in regular contact with the operational staff at the client. Um, we have um, reporting criteria, we have re review criteria, we have bonuses, all of that sort of thing. Um, they are the things, and, and so most importantly, understanding the needs of the clients and being able to report it back. Um, that's how we do our monitoring. Uh, we do it um, uh, from the day they start with good induction. Um, and then good review through from the first period and the probation period leading on to the longevity of the staff. And keeping the staff happy is, is an important part of it as well. We've got staff that have been with us seven years, um, and I'm not just talking one. There are multiple staff that have been with four, five, six, seven years. And I think that is testament to the way we've managed the staff and the way we, we, um, uh, we, we uh, motivate the staff to be yes. with us. Uh, they're important issues. That's probably an important one because, you know, depending on the size of the business, most businesses don't have those HR functions internal, do you? In Australia or in the Philippines? No, in, in Australia. So my work. Yeah, was, I, know. I know. You know. Depending on the size until you get to maybe, I don't know, 20 heads, 30 heads. And then you see, well, hang on, we need a talent performance person or we need a HR person, whatever it may be. But you don't tend to have that internally as you're growing your business. Yep. Yeah, well, we put that in from the, the start, a full operations team from the get-go. Yep, brilliant. Derek, anything you wanted to add to that question? Yeah, I suppose, look, a lot of the, how you manage staff, how you build your workforce, how you get the best out of your team, a lot of it is just fundamental management principles, okay? And it, it doesn't vary. People think you come offshore and then it's a whole different sort of um, calculation and, and whole different process and philosophy it, it's it's just very similar to basic management fundamentals you've got to manage people well you've got to be proactive with people you've got to give them a sense of culture you've got to give them a framework you've got to give them accountability you've got to give them sort of an hr structure um, in smaller businesses in the west like australia th there can be a lot of sort of and living you know like just kind of uh, people get along and that's kind of the, the startup culture. You're just sort of feeling the way around in the dark. Generally, it doesn't scale too well. And when you come offshore, you're sort of talking about kind of scaling and how do you lay the foundations for a successful organization? Okay, an organization means a group of people working, coordinating together. And so it, it's really sort of management fundamentals that need to be implemented smaller businesses in australia might not yet have those management fundamentals like um you know you mentioned with the sort of hr team and having processes having accountability and having annual reviews and things like that but these things are really valuable for your organization so it might almost sort of advance your organization in terms of how things are built how things are um set up by coming offshore, building these processes, but it does take time. You know, it, it, it takes time um, and it takes time away from the core activity of 
look, let's just get the work done. But it, it pays off and, and it's essential sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, well said, well said. And I think you're right. At, at the end of the day, um, from, a, from a time, looking at the time perspective, if you were, and you brought it back down to management as a key word there as well. So you, you'd manage the team here in Australia the way you'd manage your team over there as well. And having those fundamentals are really important just in management skills. Mm, absolutely. Well, brilliant. Absolutely. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open up to any questions you may have. We've got to 1241 pretty quickly. I don't know how that happened, but it, it happened pretty quickly. So if you've got any questions, I know all of you were muted as you came on. Some of you got your cameras off. Some of you got your cameras on. That's okay. So if you wanted to ask a question to either Derek or to Rich, please ask away. Maybe put your hand up or if you want to put something in the chat bar. Have you got something to ask? We've got something coming to the chat bar now. Here's a question. Should you start with a more junior role and train them or start with a more senior role? Sometimes more senior people don't want to come into the office. Who wants to answer that one? I saw who that's from. That's Delia McKenzie who works for us. Thanks for the Dorothy Dixon, Delia. Um, uh, look, I, I think it's horses, horses. Um, it, it'd be delightful if we could, in, in my business, it would be delightful if we could just bring um, uh, staff through from university and build them into young accountants um, and then get them through, uh, you know, the pathways program with the CPAs and, you know, do the whole, the whole works to get them to be qualified uh, in, in Australia. Um, and we're working with uh, Angeles University Foundation and Mubalat College to be able to uh, work through that. Now, I know, for example, that there are firms in our client base who will not engage um, a staff member, and these are in the professional services area, unless they are a qualified CPA. Um, and that means that they've got to have a Bachelor of Accountancy and, or not necessarily, but generally they're, they're a Bachelor of Accountancy and, uh, and they've done the CPA registration course in Australia. And they in, in the Philippines, they won't employ unless you've got that. So from that point of view, you can only bring them in with that level of experience. Yep. Now, on the other hand, we've got young book. Maybe are you working with a company in, in the Philippines and then they come over and work with us and we put them through training and they, they, they're, they're great to train. They come up to speed pretty quickly. I, I think there's one group there, one client is six or seven or eight uh, staff in that group. And they particularly like um, graduates who had one year or less in the bookkeeping arena and then train them up. And uh, they've been very successful at that. So I think it's horses. horses. Mm. Fair call. Fair call. Any other questions? Anyone yeah. else would like to unmute themselves? I thought someone mentioned, or was that you, Derek, just mentioned something? <laughs> no. No, 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 no. I'm good. I'm good. Well, that's okay. If you've got any questions, please throw them in the chat bar or you're more than welcome to unmute yourself and ask directly to Richard and Derek as well. Now, Rich, I know you've got a very important date coming up in September. Are you okay to share a little bit about that, given it is your, you mentioned it before, your 10-year yeah. anniversary? I do, I do, I do, I do. Um, and, and it's so topical because we just had a meeting about it this morning, Paul. So thank you for uh, the other Dorothy things. <laughs> But um, uh, it's Profit Masters' 10th year anniversary this year. And uh, so we have a, a conference. We've been holding business conferences now for a few years. Um, we have a business conference this time in Clark in, uh, in the Philippines. And we're inviting clients and friends of the firm and people who would like to come and see what, uh, what uh, good quality uh, offshoring is all about. To come over and spend some time at the uh, at the conference, um, we've got some great speakers. Um, we have the uh, director of Macquarie Bank in the Philippines will be speaking with us on uh, on some things about uh, markets in the Philippines and Australia. Uh, we have a um, a senior lecturer from Sydney University is coming to speak to us on uh, on a, a a topic of international uh, interest to professional services firms. Uh, we've also got some uh, speaking on uh, on on professional firm productivity, and also on marketing for professional firms. And then, of course, um, uh, without any doubt, we have to have something on uh, 
on IT security. Um, yes. We've got two sponsors, um, uh, Ashore Global, who is a, um, a a collection company based out of Brisbane, working nationally. And we also have CT Group, who are a uh, um, IT services provider, including uh, information security, uh, will be speaking with us. They've actually done an audit of our uh, IT and uh, confirmed our compliance with the requirements of IT uh, um, uh, the I what's the number of it two two seven double o one right uh, the international standard yeah. IS two seven double o one on uh, on uh, management uh, of internet security will be speaking to as well and he'll be actually speaking about the new essential eight rules um, so it's on from the eleventh to the thirteenth of September um, on the Friday evening we have our tenth year anniversary spectacular party, which is going to be at the Marriott Hotel over there. About 150 guests from Australia and from the uh, Philippines uh, will be joining us for a great time. And uh, anybody here would be very, very welcome to come along. We'd love to see you. Brilliant, well said, well said. So before um, we wrap up- Actually, just before, before I... we do that, Paul, um, can I just, um, Delia, I mentioned that Delia works from the, for, for, for us. Delia, would you mind sharing the link to the conference uh, with everybody? It's not a bad idea. You can put that in the chat yeah. bar. Before we wrap up, and it's, it's an interesting one, and I'll, I'll just give uh, both Derek and Rich the ability just to have some final comments. But uh, Rich also mentioned um, CT Group just then. So I've got one of their directors joining me for a masterclass next week. So we're talking about the global cyber landscape at the moment and considering what happened last week. I know there's a lot of people that are still concerned about how one, sorry, that is my phone continuing to go off. I apologize. Um, yeah, so we're actually doing a masterclass on e-crime and all of those elements. So if it's something you haven't registered for yet, please join my masterclass next week. It's at 12 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. So you're welcome to join. It's free of charge. So jump on board and see what you hear more, see what you like about what James will actually talk about because it's going to be a fascinating one hour Guys, before we look to wrap up, Derek, any final comments? Uh, no, just you know, give it a go. It, it is absolutely transformative. And once you get it right, you will never look back and you will never go to just the domestic workforce again. Uh, outsourcing is the most powerful business tool out there. And it's getting to a stage now where you, you can't afford to ignore it because your competitors won't. Um, so, you know, it's becoming sort of an essential business tool for the toolkit. So certainly, you know, uh, you don't need to do it, but I think you owe it to yourselves and your businesses to at least properly explore it. Uh, so, yeah, just reach out and have a conversation. You know. Yeah, it's a very good point. And I think the um, being over there last year for the Profit Master Conference and the, the, the businesses that came and we did a tour at the office, I think they were quite amazed and Rich, I'll you know obviously allow you for a, your sort of final comments, but I still remember the yeah the I don't know maybe the surprise of and you mentioned it before, mm. Richard, in terms of the professionalism at the office, uh, the scale at the office. It's just like having an office here in sort of Collins Street. It's no different. It's it's that sort of scale and that sort of vibe that you've got. So um, yeah, I think everyone was quite surprised. So well done to you for what you've actually created as well, Rich. Mate, final comments from you. Thanks, mate. Um, look, uh, I'd uh, um, enunciate the same words of Derek that, uh, yeah, give it a go. Um, it has been transformative in my business, and I'm not just talking about the outsourcing business, but it's been an incredible experience to, uh, to work, particularly with Filipinos in building a business. They relate so well with Australians. It's been a pleasure to work with, uh, with the people over there, management and staff, and all of the people that, uh, that we work with. Um, if I could just also uh, give a uh, special thanks to Derek. Uh, Derek, um, thank you very much for coming on, on, on this today. You, uh, you are well known in the outsourcing industry and uh, you speak uh, eloquently about not only the advantages of the outsourcing industry, but those who are part of it as well. Uh, and I thank you very much for coming on uh, today. It's very much appreciated. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Paul, for organizing it. It's, it's really, it's really valuable and, and I think it's it's so important for the community to to really sort of understand outsourcing. So yeah, thank you. Yeah.
Thank spot you. on the money. And I think the advice and the comments from both of you have been absolutely outstanding. So thank you again from, from me. Um, again, we're going to be running these monthly. So again, we've got topics that we're going to raise with regards to offshoring again. So look out for the next invitation as this panel series continues. But for all of you that have joined us, thank you very much for joining us today. Dot on 1250. So we've stuck to our timeframes. Um, if you want to know more, obviously reach out to someone like Adelia McKenzie. Look up Dealey McKenzie on LinkedIn or look up Richard. And obviously, if you want to know more about Derek, look up Derek as well, because as you can tell, these guys are very well versed in what they talk about and what they know. So till I see you next time, thanks for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Richard. Join us at Profit Master. Passionate people, passionate careers.